So far, most of the equations that we've considered, most of the reactions we've considered in this lesson have been gas phase reactions. And in that case, uh, we mostly have been looking at ideal gases, although we have seen a little bit of how that changes when we have a non-ideal gas. I, I want to close this out by just briefly considering what happens when we have a reaction that is not purely a gas phase reaction. It could be a heterogeneous reaction that involves more than one phase, so for example, a solid reacting with a liquid. Uh, it could be a reaction that uh, is all in the liquid phase, all in the solution phase. But no matter what it is, it's one where we have to take a little bit different approach. Fortunately, it's an approach that I hope you won't find too difficult to absorb. Remember when we talked about solutions, we wrote down an expression for the chemical potential of the J uh, component of a solution that looks something like this, where we wrote down uh, the reference value for its liquid as a pure substance plus RT log of uh, another quantity that uh, would allow us to treat this solution even if it was not an ideal solution. So what I'm talking about here is the activity. So remember AJ is the chemical activity of component J in this mixture. All right, so this chemical activity, though, uh, you can think of it as being sort of like this magic ingredient. If you include this in there, it takes care of all of your problems. You can use it to represent uh, pressure. For example, in one limit, we've seen that uh, this chemical activity was re related to the partial pressure over the pressure, uh, all the, over the partial pressure of it uh, when it was over a pure liquid. Okay, so this is sort of an ideal solution mark or, or a Raoult's Law reference point. Um, we also saw that it could be used in a Henry's Law uh, limit. If, it were, if these were non-ideal gases, we could even trade this one in for a ratio of the fugacities okay, for these substances. All right, but whatever it may be, um, this activity allows us to treat anything from a gas to a solution to even a solid or a liquid. All right, so the activity builds in, builds in non-ideality, but it maintains all of the same form of the equations um, that we've seen for ideal gases. So what that means in particular is that some of these equations that we've been writing over and over again in this lesson look like this, okay, where we've got a reference form of the Gibbs energy and then we add to it RT times log of a reaction quotient. But now I'm going to write that reaction quotient in terms of these activities. And so what that will look like is the activity of component C raised to its uh, stoichiometric coefficient times the activity of component D raised to its stoichiometric coefficient divided by the same quantities for the uh, reactants A and B. And again, of course, I am referring to our standard uh, nu A plus B going to C and D reaction, all right, where these are the stoichiometric coefficients of those quantities. All right, so what we've defined here, in effect, is a general reaction quotient in terms of activity. See, we always use a subscript just so you know what it's written in terms of. But this reaction quotient is a completely general one. It has the right limits as we go to ideal gases. It has the right limits as we go to ideal solutions um, because of using the activity uh, to reference this. It also means now that we can define an equilibrium constant in terms of the activities that would simply be this expression translated over. So I'll write it out again just because I enjoy writing the same thing over and over again. But it'll look like this. All right, so this will be, the, in effect, our, our, our equilibrium constant in terms of the activities. Now, I'll, I'll note parenthetically that, in fact, you can see that this is where uh, the expressions you may have learned in general chemistry come from when you've written down an, idea, an, an equilibrium constant. Because you may recall that we wrote them down in terms of concentrations uh, raised to these powers. So it might look something like this in the notation that we would have used then. Well, these concentrations are nothing different than the activities, although they're idealized activities, 
but they're nothing more than the activities that are coming from that equation there. So this expression that you may have used in general chemistry is in fact derivative of this expression here. This one being uh, the more general expression, I guess, for all of this. There's another thing that uh, you may recall from general chemistry, and that is that if we ever had a pure liquid or solid, did we include that in the equilibrium constant expression? Well, if you remember correctly, we probably didn't. And there's a good reason for that. We can actually show, and I'm not going to do the derivation because I don't know that the derivation is that important, but we can show that using some of the same thermodynamics that we've used to uh, handle um, different quantities uh, thermodynamically, we can show that the log of the activity of a pure liquid or solid would be equal to its molar volume over RT times pressure minus one bar. So if the pressure is close to one bar, obviously this term goes very close to zero. But even when this pressure is not close to one bar, the molar volume is very small for most liquids and solids. I mean, think about it. 18 mils of, a liquid, uh, of liquid water is a lot smaller than 22 liters of one mole of a gas at standard temperature and pressure. So, in fact, this quantity is usually very, very small. It's typically around 0.00 two or something like that. So when you raise E to the 0 0.002 power, you get something that's pretty close to one. So in effect, what we do is we simply assume that for pure liquids and solids, we can uh, treat their uh, acti chemical activities as though they were equal to one. And since they're equal to one, we don't have to include them up here in our expression for the equilibrium constant. So that's the actual reason why you didn't have to include those in your equilibrium constant way back then when you took chemistry.